All right, what's happening, everyone? Happy holidays. Chuck with you. Houdini is on as well. Let's get this waiting room off and let's fire up the show. Welcome to Chatterbox Bearcats, everyone. Chuck Walter alongside Houdini with you after the Bearcats uh, take down Merrimack in pretty convincing fashion, but it did get a little bit pesky late. 65-49, the final score in favor of Merrimack. Uh, this is the little behind-the-scenes look before the show officially starts and we run the intro. Uh, Hudson, give me just an opening thought, a statement about this game and what was a snooze fest, to say the least. It was ugly. I, I wasn't excited. I thought we'd come out and punch somebody in the mouth before or after we got embarrassed uh, at the uh, U.S. Bank Arena by Dayton. What, honestly, like like I told you before the game, I'm more concerned. We, we need to really kind of figure out a rotation at this point before we get into Big 12 play. But, no, unimpressed. Um, I thought we did some okay things towards the end of the game, but sloppy, sloppy game. Sloppy is the one word I was getting ready to use to describe it as well. All right, this is Chatterbox Bearcats with Chuck and Houdini. Let's get it fired up. And it abruptly stops. We're, st we're still working on that. We're getting the producer on it. Um, Cincinnati takes down Merrimack 65-49 today, improved to 9-2 and two on the season. When you're talking about an NCAA tournament resume at this point of the year, this game does absolutely nothing for you in that regard. It does absolutely nothing in the fact that Aziz Bandego and C.J. Frederick weren't playing, so you don't get a real look at your rotations. I guess a takeaway could be, you know, if someone steps up that doesn't get the minutes they typically get, but I don't even think we got that. It was just straight up a game that you had to win. They won it. They didn't cover, I don't think. It wasn't necessarily pretty. I learned nothing. I, I, I gained no entertainment factor from it. It was just, uh, it was obligatory. And that's what we're doing right now, giving you the obligatory postgame show. Obligatory? That's how we're pronouncing that these days? Obligatory? That's how, okay. That's how we're pronouncing it with my Ohio University right. Scripps Journalism School education. Obligatory. Fair. Obligatory. And I think the one silver lining you can look at, because there was, yeah, this game was disgusting. I, no one even knows what Mary Max uh, zone defense was. They were running like a, a wide 2-3 at one point that turned into a 1-3-1, one, one, that turned into like a 1-4 a a little bit of 4-1. I have no idea what they were doing, but it, it worked to some extent. We were turning the ball over like crazy. Um, but I think we got to see, and I'm sure we got this somewhere on the rundown anyway, but just to bury the lead, at least Jameel Reynolds didn't look great by any means. He was missing a ton of bunnies. He looked rusty as hell, but he is clearly a specimen um, that we're going to need big time, and I'm glad he got to throw some clunkers off the rim, get it out of his system because – we're going to need him. That, that's clear as day. And he looked like he was bigger, stronger. Um, he's, his conditioning needs a little bit of work. But, I mean, he missed a bunch of bunnies. But I'll take it. Um, he's got a couple games before we get into Big 12 play. So, I, I hope he gets all the, the shots up he can at this point. Yeah, he's 6'11", 280. I thought he was more like 6'9", 230 entering the year. And then right before he got eligible, I just kind of looked up the uh, – the roster one day to see what he was officially listed at. And I'm like, oh, I was 50 pounds off and a couple inches. So, yeah, he is a large, large man that moves pretty decent for someone his size. Pay raise, man. That's the first topic. What are we doing with this schedule? And I say pay raise because Trace Fowler, if you're watching, I haven't hopped in the chat room yet. I will in a minute. If you're watching, it's time to increase the salary here. I mean, after having to watch that game two hours on December 19th, during the holidays, we got decorations to do. I got to go check out Christmas lights on our street, see what we're working with. If we have any Clark Griswolds running around, holiday movies, um, just going out in general, enjoying the 32 degree temperatures, which is a lot better than the like 16 that it was yesterday. And instead, we are obligated to watch that. And now obligated to watch a game against Stetson. I don't know if the Bearcats have ever played a game against Stetson. I'm just the, – the schedule, man, I, I don't understand it. I know that there's a, a lot of things that go into it that are way above our pay grade, but 
What what was the schedule getting us ready for the Big 12? What were we thinking with all these patsies? It hasn't worked out. It has not worked out to say the least. I mean, the, the two games, I mean, you could argue, I guess, Georgia Tech at home, but we are not battle tested in the slightest. The two games we had, a Xavier team that I don't think is very good, a Dayton team that I, I think is probably a tournament team at best. And we got, I mean, absolutely manhandled at U.S. Bank Arena. Um, and shout out, I guess, to that guy that was in the chat saying UD would bring more fans. I I was embarrassed. I was at the game last Saturday. I missed the show. Probably for the best. I would have had to have been censored the entire time. Um, they We got embarrassed there. We got embarrassed at Cintas Center. So I, I think you're going to see Wes – switch up how the, the schedule is configured. I don't know how far out we already have everything locked in, but I would think he's going to change the way he's doing these cupcake games because we're not getting shit out of playing Mary Mack and Stetson. Okay. Nothing. That's not helping us in, in the slightest. It's really just a chance to lose potentially um, nothing really to gain. And this isn't college football. You can lose a couple early games and then regain that momentum, the net ranking RPI, all that shit. You can regain that. We have the opportunities against the Big 12. You don't really get penalized as badly to lose these games. So you got to schedule. And I look at it through the lens of content, too. Since we're doing this every single night, you look at uh, a, a sports media powerhouse, like a Kentucky Sports Radio, which Matt Jones, who was on our show, The Chatter, that's a shameless plug to uh, d subscribe to that podcast oh, right yeah. now. Matt Jones was able to build that thing up in part because Kentucky plays a big game every single weekend, it seems like. You know, they have the SEC schedule, but forget that. They schedule, like, five Blue Bloods and off or a uh, OOC, it feels like. Give us some of those. You know, maybe not to Kentucky's extent. I can't talk tonight. But just give me something in, in that regard. And Merrimack, Stetson, Evansville's actually pretty decent, but the, the Howards of the world, this isn't doing it for us. Um, didn't learn anything from tonight. I don't think we got anything out of it. I will say this. That was a pesky bunch. I think Cincinnati had 18 turnovers in the game. Official number in the chat room if, if I mess that up. But 18 turnovers from this pesky Howard team that was clearly undermanned, which is why Cincinnati dominated them on the glass. Official number was, I'm going to guess like 46 to 28. It was a 45 to 25. Pretty good guess for me. So Cincinnati out-rebounds Merrimack again by 20. It's clear right now that Cincinnati's a really good rebounding team, and when they have size, they can take down teams that are much smaller than them. So this seems like the perfect time to have an OOC game before you go into BYU and have a team that's maybe as big as you to see how you can stack up physically instead of this game against Merrimack. So, yeah, I, I don't understand it, back to your point. But um, they were pesky. I'll, I'll give them that. Yeah, no, like like I was saying before, no one knows what zone defense they were running, but it worked. They were doing a lot of um, having us throw the ball over the place. Um, our zone offense, it, it always needs some work. We didn't have CJ, who's really kind of our only dead eye. I mean, I don't even know how many threes we hit today. I think we hit a couple at the end. Um, let's see what we finished at. All right. I mean, five of – you'd think we'd get more off, but the, the – the bizarre way they were running, it was almost like a 1-3-1 one, one most of the game. So we didn't get as many of those open threes that you would typically get. We finished 5 of 12, 40, 41%. I mean, we'll take it. But, yeah, it was uh, it was sloppy. We were throwing all the ball over the place. And we missed bunny after bunny. I mean, I don't know how, what the final stats are. Um, but at the rim shots, we missed damn near everything. It was uh, almost comical at one point. Merrimack missed everything. At one point in the second half, they were shooting 27% from the floor and from three, while UC was shooting 50% and 42%. And it was like an 11-point game at that point. So uh, ugly, to say the least. Putting you on the spot here. Coach Houdini, in this scenario, you have Wes's job for the next, let's go with 30 days. So you get Wes's job for this murderer's row that's coming up in the Big 12 that we'll talk about in just a minute. That's a tease. Um, so you want a corn dog eating contest in this hypothetical hypothetical, maybe. Um, so right now, Wes is playing a combo of bigs 
it's either Jamil and Victor, it's Jamil and Odie, it's Odie and Aziz, it's Victor and Aziz. You know, he's playing the combo at all points, it seems like, aside from maybe two minutes tonight when he played, I think, Skillings and Newman at the same time at the three and four. In this scenario, you have free reigns, your head coach, at the lineups. What are you changing right now? Are you ever going with the two bigs? No, it, it would depend, be dependent on the specific team we're playing, but it, it has not worked out going with the two bigs. I kind of said this at the beginning of the year. It started to look okay, but then we realized against good competition. I mean, we finished it out today. We went small at the very end of the game. I don't know what, I don't know what Wes is thinking when he puts Odie and another big in there. And especially today, he was putting them in the um, – like the free throw line area, the center of the zone at the high post. That's the last guy on earth that we should have the ball. That's supposed to be your playmaker. Not, not Odie Aguama. I love Odie, but it, I'm not sure if his minutes moving forward should continue in this rotation. Aside from if we get in a little bit of foul trouble, I don't mind him being maybe the only big, but he clogs up the lane and he can't shoot. Um, but to your question, I would go small ball. I think most of the fans would. I think we saw it at the end of the game. It started to work. We had um, we got we had, yeah we had Day Day Jizzle, um, Lacocious, Newman, and Lockin in to to end the game. And obviously, you can intertwine Aziz and now Jamil Reynolds there. We might see some of that double stacked twin towers moving forward. But I think at this point, the proof's in the pudding. We got to go small. If we want to compete with some of these, I mean, should have done it against Xavier. Really, that that was the the big issue. We were getting crushed having two seven footers out there. Box score looks as such: Victor Locken, eighteen points on eight of fourteen shooting. He had seven rebounds and three assists. No fouls in the game. Odio Guama had eight points and three rebounds. John Newman had two points and six rebounds. After a pretty hot start to the season from John Newman, it seems like he's been silent the last two or three. Uh, Simas Lukosius, 11 points, three assists, and a couple of rebounds for him. Only took four shots in the game. Would love to see Simas, you know, get a little more involved in the offense. Um, that's efficiency right there, though, 11 points. Dede Thomas had seven, four, and three. Jameel Reynolds had seven points and 11 rebounds. Jizzle James had four points and three rebounds. Josh Reed had three points in his limited minutes. And Dan Skillings had five points in the game. Uh, next up for Cincinnati. It's the Stetson Hatters. And at this point, I think it's safe to say that, and before we get into Stetson, the, the ADHD train, we're, we're going right off the tracks. I, I have to ask you a quick question about free throws. Is this the worst free throw shooting Cincinnati team you've ever seen? Um, is, that, is, is that too much of a stretch? Is it too early? I mean, they're shooting legit 50% consistently, it seems like. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a stretch, and it's only a stretch because I think historically over the last 15 years, UC has to be damn near dead last in free throw shooting. Some of mixed teams were so damn bad. Even back to the Huggins era, we were missing. It seemed like every time we're at the line, I was like, it's almost a guaranteed miss. At best, we're looking at one out of two. Um, so I think as time moves on, I don't think this is the worst free throw shoot, shooting uh, team that we've seen in the – in the last, you know, few years even. I think that'll play out. But, um, I mean, when, we, when we're playing the two seven-footers, they're not necessarily inclined to make a ton of free throws. So that might be swaying um, some of the statistics right now. But I think that is something that we'll, we'll figure out. I, I don't think this will be the, the word. I don't think it'll be Titus Rubles, you know, shooting threes 2.0 moving forward. So it's the Stetson Hatters up next. Then it's Evansville. Evansville is 9-2, and two, um, so a little better than some of the teams they've been playing, but it's Evansville. Come on now. So two games right there that you got to win entering Big 12 play. Bearcats would be 11-2. and two. That's when they go into the hardest five-game stretch and six-game stretch, rather, I think, in, in program history. They got BYU on the road, Texas at Baylor, TCU, and Oklahoma. Four of those five teams are ranked. I think TCU could be ranked, too. Um, five straight ranked teams in a row. I know Cincinnati was in the old Big East with arguably, you know, the, the best three, four-year run in conference history when you added the teams and, you know, Notre Dame was at their peak and you had some of these other teams in the, the Big East that were on top of it, Pittsburgh and Georgetown. I don't think because there was always like a Providence or a Seton Hall or St. John's or a, a Rutgers or someone sandwiched in there. 
I don't know if we've had this difficult of a five-game stretch. At BYU, Texas, at Baylor, TCU, and Oklahoma. Buckle up. We don't know a lot about this team, except for what we've seen against the teams from well, the uh, Tri-State and, and Dayton as well. The, the next game, Chuck, is Kansas, by the way. Just a heads up. The sixth game of that stretch is Kansas on the road, number two in the country. Oh, I didn't get all the way so, to Kansas. Just throw, just throw that in there. Uh, let's throw that in there. So instead of five-game stretch, <laughs> the most difficult six-game stretch, then you get UCF, West Virginia. Um, you have a couple seconds to breathe before it's at Texas Tech, Houston, and Iowa State. I mean, if Cincinnati isn't good, they're going to be exposed very quickly. There's no hiding like they were able to do last year with the horrible non-conference. Then they won a few games in the AAC, and you start to believe, like, maybe this team is decent, and they turned it around after the Xavier game. No, you're going to learn very quickly if this team is absolute. You want to say it for me? Well, this answers, yeah, absolute just dog shit. I know I've been saying that a few times, but this is why, Wes, this this is why he didn't want to schedule real teams outside of this conference because I think he wanted to get that win-loss column headed in the right direction, and this is why he did it. I mean, he's looking at the stretch. It's, you know, six straight top 25 teams, um, apparently when we get a breather is UCF and West Virginia. So, I mean, that tells you enough. It's going to be a hell of a stretch. Um, I wish we were more battle tested moving into it. Like you said, Evansville is going to be at least a solid warm up, I maybe, but this is going to be a tough stretch for me and you too. We got 10 o'clock Eastern BYU on the road. So we got to, I'm going to be drinking coffee that night. It's going to be, it's going to be a tough stretch, not only for the players, but think of guys like us that got to cover this. This is going to be brutal. It's a Saturday. You have it in you. You're up You're up till midnight on Saturday. Come on now. You don't need any coffee. Um, just the adrenaline of the Bearcats' first win ever in the Big 12. I can picture it. Or, and this is potentially likely as well, I could picture this just being a horrible year of Chatterbox Bearcats to where it's a lot of us just like, well, Houdini, we're here. Uh, let's talk about it once again. Cats are 0 and 9 in the Big 12, but we're not putting that on the table. We're knocking on wood that this team is gonna look like they did to start the season. And granted, to start the season, they were playing a bunch of nobodies. But you beat Georgia Tech by 30. I think Georgia Tech just took down a, another serviceable team. Actually, let's get this live. Yeah, I, I think we just got to figure out the rotation, man. Uh, I think Wes has to tighten it a little bit. I think it's it's one of those tough situations where he loves these kids and, and they love him, vice versa. But sometimes for the betterment of the team, you got to – we don't need to play 10 guys. I mean, hell, Coach K was notorious for playing his starters like 40. You wouldn't even take some of the guys out. Like, Tyus Jones played 40 minutes every game. We need Jizzle to be playing closer. Jizzle needs to be playing over half the game. I mean, hell, he played, what, 18 minutes against Dayton, something like that? Like, that can't happen. Um, he needs to play more. I don't even mind having Day Day and Jizzle playing at the same time. Um, but we just need to tighten the rotation and get guys more in a rhythm, right? And because I think we have the guys. I mean, I keep saying that, and it, it's not necessarily moving, correlating to the floor. But I think we have it in us. We're going to find out, you know, real quickly. But that, that's what I think we need to do. Tighten this rotation up and, and at least let it fly. Let our best guys lose us the game if it comes to it. You heard that from straight out of Coach Houdini's mouth himself. Best guys out there. I, I would have never thunk it. Who who would have thunk right. such a who strategy in a men's basketball game? Put your best guys out there. That, that's all it takes. Uh, Georgia Tech beat Penn State 82-81 on Saturday. So that's a um, it's a win right now that's looking better and better. If Georgia, I know their net ranking's not great right now, but if, if they win in the ACC, inevitably, that's going to be at some point a decent win. So you'll take one in the non-conference is uh, Tech beats Penn State. Here's what I'm going to need Cincinnati to do. Closing thought. They have these bigs. You now have three seven-footers and Odie who, you know, is, is six foot nine and long. Pick up some fouls. I mean, what are we doing? Pick up some fouls. We can shuffle these guys in there if we're not playing the Twin Towers, like I said. You go four-guard lineup. Throw a big in there. You know, keep your four guards in there. Find your four best guards. Keep them in there. And rotate the bigs. Get them down low. Pick up fouls. Maybe not as much locking. But when Oguama's out there, he only had two today. Uh, Jameel Reynolds picked up a couple of fouls. Pick up four. 
you know, get get physical. Pick up four and Aziz when you're out there too. Pick up three. I don't care. Um, if you're rotating the bigs, it's as simple as that. And if you're not, and you don't want to pick up the fouls, then play Victor Lockin at your five, and you know, sub Aziz in there too. I, I don't know. It's it's a much more daunting task than we give it credit for figuring out this team because, like you said, a Wes loves these guys. B Lockin's putting up you know 18 a game. Uh, Bandago gives you a talent that you can't coach, you know, yeah. and that you don't have. I mean, we team. saw that offensive rating. Um, it was from what the Bearcat bunch from CBB Analytics, where they show our offensive rating numbers and all that stuff. And Aziz is, you know, and he's got limited minutes so far, but he's essentially boosts our offensive rating by 22 points. So. It's tough when you got Lockin playing as well as he is and Aziz also playing as well as he is. If you're Wes, you're like, so how do I divvy up the minutes if we're going to go small ball lineup? I don't necessarily think we have to stick with small ball the entire game, but we need more pockets of at least feeling out the game and making adjustments because we've seen it not work. We know that, right? Yeah. So let's figure out, uh, you know, we, we got to adjust on the fly. If we're playing a team where a small ball lineup works better, then yeah, we're going to have to sit one of the – now we got four big guys in the rotation. I think Odie's minutes, as the chat is going nuts, is going to uh, – they're going to diminish a little bit here. I think we're going to see that, especially uh, moving forward when we get into the Big 12 play. Yeah, and um, it, it's tough with Aziz right now because defensively, you saw it against Dayton. He couldn't guard anyone. I mean, it was ugly. I know he blocked some shots, and when he does block them, they're so cool that you forget about all the bad plays that he makes defensively. But there was one where – uh, they just spun right by him and dunked it, and he was just sitting there. And it's that's what I'm talking about. You got to use your fouls. You got to get physical. Um, West really needs to coach this bunch up because I hate to go back to Mick Cronin because he is not our coach anymore. It's Wes. Wes is our guy, but Cronin got the most out of the limited talent that he had. You know, the Steve Toyloys of the world and the the um, Marcus Sykes, whoever it may be. He got them to play hard defensively. You can't tell me that, you know, a combination of Aziz, Jamil, Victor Lockin, and Odio Guama with five fouls each to give, that you you couldn't get, you know, a little more physical than they've gotten. We, we, we get they're a really good rebounding team offensively. It hasn't necessarily led to points, especially the last few games. I mean, I guess it led to points at the beginning of the year, but not the last few games. But it's defensively right now um, because you don't get a gauge from this Merrimack game today. The only two gauges we have, three gauges we have, were those road games where they were tested. Howard, Xavier, Dayton, they gave up more than 80 every single time. And quite frankly, a lot of it had to do with the bigs couldn't, you know, they couldn't guard anyone. Yeah. No, the, the bigs got smoked. I know Dayton had a super talented big. Um, that wasn't out of nowhere. That kid's been very good. And he yeah. torched us. And to your point, they we were hacking the shit out of Dayton. I, I was at the game. I think they, I swear they shot 40 free throws. Um, I don't know if they were all warranted. I think we got hosed per usual um, by the refs, but uh, we were losing that game no matter what. Um, but yeah, our our defensive side of the ball, with especially in the post, has been lacking to say the least. And I kind of thought that would have been our strength with Aziz. We'll see with Jamil. I I'm not really sure what to expect him from him defensively. I can tell he's getting gassed in like 40 seconds so far. <laughs> Which, which makes sense because he hasn't played in competitive basketball in quite some time. So it's going to take him. That's why I think these next couple games before Big 12 play, we got to just get him minutes up and down the floor. Let him run around um, because we're going to need him to, to bang with some of these big dudes uh, when we play the Kansases and the Baylors and the Texas of the world. So, Yeah, so I take back entirely what I said um, considering – Dayton did shoot 30 free throws in the last game. So don't use all your fouls. Let's just defend better. <laughs> it's as simple as that. That's a that's a long way of saying just defend better. It's as simple as that. But you have five Be fouls to yeah. use. Get physical. Um, Cincinnati wins at 65-49. Let's finish with some, um, with some viewer questions. Let's go through the chat. Appreciate it, Reds Daily. $1.99. Reds Daily. I'm going to Venmo you that. What are you doing with that $1.99 tonight? Bag of Funyuns? <laughs> Uh, yeah, shit. I mean, how much are the uh, – damn, what are those freaking teas going for again, the Arizona iced teas? Didn't they jump those up to $1.25 or something? 
You can't so, eat those. I don't know. Those maybe next are, those show. Those things are loaded with sugar, Houdini. You're not going to have joints by the time you're 40. Come on now. Well, that's fine. Maybe I won't be able to. My teeth will fall out, so I won't have to talk about this team uh, once we enter Big 12 play. Ah, oh, that's a hell of a one-liner. Thank you for the dollar ninety-nine, so Houdini could weave his way to that one-liner. Kevin C says the perimeter defense is weak as AF. Uh, perimeter front court. I don't think the defense has been great anywhere, at least in um, the the three losses tonight. I thought the defense was good. I thought they were getting stops. They were fine. There was just no cohesion on offense because of the fact that, you know, that zone came out A, and B, they just turned it over. I mean, the 18 turnovers, as we mentioned. Um, Gray Bush Live says Memphis scheduled hard and is rolling. Um, we got Matt Myers throwing in a Muller High School, Big Texas. Okay, we got that. Kevin C., any team that has a big guy that will shoot outside will smoke Cincy. That sounds a lot like Kansas and Hunt, 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 Hunt. Huh. I just had a little seizure on the air. Hunter Dickinson. Yeah. Holy cow, baby. Put that one on Twitter and tag me. Jesus Christ, it's been a long night. Yeah, we've struggled. We've struggled since you can't speak. I'll say it for you. We have struggled. Just act like that was a glitch in the in the video. You're good. Um, yeah. We've struggled against anybody. I mean, we saw it today. Victor Locken against a dude from Merrimack. They, he tried to close out on a big a six foot ten guy that could shoot threes, whatever his name was, like O'Connell or something. And Victor Lockin looked like he was on Fountain Square, just ice skating. I mean, he flew back like 15 feet. Bad. So it's going to be tough. And Aziz has done this in his limited time that he's been with us. He has struggled to get out on the three-point line as well. So I think that's a fair point, but I think they're going to learn quickly. You can't give, especially some of these bigs, as skilled as they are in the Big 12, you can't give them like five feet. You can't just hover around the paint and let these guys fire away. So... That, that is going to be something we got to deal with. Reds Daily giving us the, uh, the the toughest question in show history because Houdini and myself are two of the most biased when it comes to our takes ever. I mean, we've been saying Final Four for how many years in our group chat? You know, when, when Aziz got freed, That's I told straight. you this is a uh, remember where you were type moment. And so far, it hasn't really played out to be that way. Honestly, I forgot where I was already when I learned about Aziz Vandego. But... Um, what, what would you say our conference record would be right now? I'll, I'll give you the floor first as I'm thinking. Actually, I'm just going to blurt it out. I think this team is going to be – they play 18, right? 18 nowadays? I think – Trying to do the math. I think they can win uh, – I think they can win eight or nine games. I think they can go 500 in this league. And you say, well, Chuck, that means they're a really good team. I think they're not bad. I mean, Ken Palm says they're not bad. They have some players – they have to figure it out. It comes down to Wes at the end of the day. He got the talent through the door. Last year, I couldn't say that. This year, I can. Has the talent on the team. Has to find a way to, to coach them to play more to their strengths because they have a lot of different pieces, and they haven't figured out how to use all those pieces. Yeah, I mean, I'm never going to say anything less than the 9-9. Nine and nine. So, yeah, I'm just telling you that right out of the gate. I'm never going to say less than that. If they go 500, that means we're a tournament team. I still believe that that can be the case if, again, if we figure out this rotation, if we can get an identity for the love of God. Um, but I think we got the guys in place. I still have faith in our boy Wes, even though I'm a little worried about his mental. I feel like at halftime I was like, oh, God, somebody get him a water. He's chewed through 68 packs of gum. He looked nervous as shit. But he'll, he'll right the ship, I believe so. But give me, yeah, give me nine and nine. Remember, we, we play half these games at home. So it's not like we're all doing, you know, it's not all going to be at U.S. Bank or at the Cintas. We're a much better team at home. So give That's me nine and nine. That's where I chime in, though. That's where I chime in. They haven't been, at least in the big games, a much better team at home in this era, even dating back to, like, John Brandon. They have not protected home floor at all, it seems like. They've lost a lot to Memphis at home. Uh, Brandon had to escape with a few wins over Temple and and uh, Memphis at home that, that first year that he had that was ended by COVID. So... They haven't been, like, outstanding at home since the Cronin era, I would say. And that's – you're right. That's the difference of the season. If they can – the Oklahomas of the world and the TCUs and the Iowa States, if they can just be competitive and handle business against most of those teams at home, sneak out one or two on the road, 8-10 and 10 may get you in, man. 8-10 and 10 may get you in with the uh, non-conference that they had, which was nothing really negative. 
nothing really positive. It was just a, a non-conference that was a wash and an 8-10 and 10 conference record in one of the best conferences ever. I think that could get you in. So 8-9, eight, eight, we'll, we'll take that. Absolutely. I mean, again, though, we're looking – we're looking at six games off the rip that are all ex- – you could lose every one of those games and not even be a bad team. You could lose every damn game. So it's going to be – it's an uphill battle. It's going to be an uphill battle. But, yeah, I'm going to I'm gonna stick with my guns. We'll go – yeah, I think 8-10 and 10 gets you in the tournament too, dude. I really do. This, this conference is loaded. And last question for you before we sign off for the night. Reds Daily says – who would shoot a higher percentage on bunnies, Odie or Houdini? Um, I've seen Houdini's floater game. Had nothing on mine. He, he was more of a stop and pop kind of guy. Would stop at the elbow. Had nice elbow jumper form. But um, in, in terms of the floaters, no. But um, he, he didn't say floaters. Well, he maybe floaters, Odie so. needs to take needs to take a hint from me then, because half the time he gets it and he'll just try to dribble. I don't know what he's trying to do. You're already four feet from the rim, brother. Just. One dribble, maybe power dribble, put the hook up. Um, but yeah, I'll give I give Odie. I like Odie. He's an energy guy. I like him. I just think we're putting him in spots to fail. I think he's more of a guy we bring off the bench for a few minutes a game. Uh, or if we have foul trouble, he can do more than that. But we got too much talent from the bigs. And uh, to answer your question, yeah, I never shot the ball closer than five feet uh, to the rim because I would get swatted into the twelfth row. But yeah, that's why Odie should be it. better than that. Yeah, that's why he shot it uh, 28% from three in his senior year at Elder. Those numbers are skewed, though. He started like 0 of 17 to start the They're year. They're skewed. Picked it up late. It's all about what you do in March. Um, we, we talked at the beginning about the pay raise and how uh, we needed a pay raise for doing a, a post show after Merrimack. Trace didn't say how long we had to go. We could have gone five minutes and ripped through this entire thing. We've been talking about corn dogs and whatever the hell we've been talking about for a half hour. So that does it for the show. See you, everyone. Have a good one. We will see you on uh, Friday. It's a Friday. We're playing Stetson on a Friday night. Oh, we may uh, we may call Elliot Rearing. <laughs> Elliot, if you're on the chat, you may be making your debut <laughs> um, because Friday against Stetson is going to be tough for me. Um, anyone watching that wants to guess it? No, Elliot's got it. So Elliot will handle it on Friday, it sounds like. Um, that's, that's unofficial, but um, I, I believe in him. So 